Welcome back to Econ 103, Introduction to Microeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at negative production externalities and environmental economics. We're going to be taking a look at the walkthrough of working through a problem. Of course, this has assumed you've already watched the videos on externalities, taxes, and environmental econ. Uh, this is just a specific problem that we're going to walk through. In this video, what we're going to be taking a look at is, well, first, a negative production externality. But once you've worked that out, we'll work out what our private level of production is and we'll figure out our level of welfare at this private level of production. We'll then go to correct this negative externality. We will correct it with an excise tax. And then once we have this corrected with an excise tax, we're figuring out the socially optimal level of production. We will then bring in the environmental econ side. We'll say that, hey, this negative externality was due to, let's say, coal powered electricity or something of the like. And hey, if we know what that cost is to society, if we know what the total amount of pollution is, well, then we can go and work through things like an emissions tax, that's like our carbon tax, or we can figure out optimal number of pollution permits, optimal number amount of pollution abatement, and work through our cap and trade system as well. So let's go jump over. Let's go take a look at that to start us off. Okay, so here we have our initial setup information. Uh, what we have for us is our initial supply and demand for this market. We have, hey, we have total current pollution, a little bit of shorthand there, but total current pollution is 26 tons of greenhouse gas. And we have the information that, hey, at our current level of production and our current level of pollution, the total external cost to society, that is the cost of using up environmental resources without paying for it, just pushing that burden, that cost on the society. That social cost is $130. Uh, that's right, maybe not so realistic. Kind of keep in mind, this could be $130 million. We could just be dealing with everything kind of rounded off to the nearest million. To start off, for myself, I like to visualize what I'm dealing with. So let's start off by graphing our initial situation here. So in doing so, let's go vertical axes, horizontal axes, of course the vertical one, that's our price, horizontal, that's our quantity. Well, what we're gonna have is downward sloping, our demand curve. In this case though, what we wanna think about it is, yeah, sure, it's our demand. This is also gonna be our marginal private benefit. And it's also gonna be our marginal social benefit. That is, in this case here, all the benefit that I receive from consuming this good is received entirely by me. There's no extra benefit received by anybody else. So that marginal private benefit equals marginal social benefit because I'm part of society. 150 and 150 minus five. So our other intercept there on the other side, that's gonna work out to be 30 units over here as our horizontal intercept. And again, right, the way we can quickly get that is the vertical intercept divided by the magnitude of the slope. So 150 divided by five. On the other side, we have our supply curve. So again, with our numbers, we have 20. And then going up, we get our supply. And this is our supply, or other way to think about this is the marginal private cost. That is what we'd normally just call our marginal cost, but hey, in this case here, it's just the marginal cost of the firms of the everyone producing. So it doesn't really work out to the same as the marginal cost of society, because in this case, we're dealing with a negative production externality, and that is every time we produce a unit, there's an extra cost, the environmental cost, which the firm gets to produce for free, right? They get to use up this environmental resource for free, society ends up paying for it. So what we wanna do is figure out our private optimal, that is where the marginal private cost equals the marginal private benefit. And we'll see that that takes place, well, of course, right where the two curves intersect. And we'll get our quantity private. So let's start off by figuring that out. Now, do we figure this guy out? Well, again, this is gonna be our standard case of setting our two curves equal to each other. So let's go about doing that. So we have price equals price. So that is 150 minus 5Q equals 20 plus 5Q. Uh, just going through, right? We want to 
bring the cues together and then we want to isolate them. So consolidate then isolate. So let's uh, go about adding 5q to both sides. So we get 150 equals 20 minus 10q. Uh, let's get this, uh, I don't like this, sorry that's plus, plus 10q. Let's get this 20 over there. So 130 equals 10q. And then finally getting the q by itself, divide both sides by 10. We have 13 equals our quantity. And that there, that's our private one there. So let's just make some room and update the value. So there we go, that guy there, that is 13 units produced at our private optimal. And again, if we are talking about, let's give it some context, if this is coal power, and we'll say quantity is something like in megawatt hours, how many megawatt hours are produced altogether, well then, hey, our private optimal, if the firm was just left to be, they would produce 13 megawatt hours given their scenario. Great. What we want to do then, and this is going to be kind of throwing in our environmental side right on top of this externality. So let's bring the two together here. I'm just going to get rid of this just to make some room. Let's just, no, we won't get rid of it. We'll just drag it down there for the time being. But what we want to keep in mind is, yeah, we are looking at megawatt hours, but implicitly attached to this, as we've seen, is hey, for every unit produced, there's some amount of pollution, some amount of emission, which is released into the atmosphere. And that is the pollution cost. So that is, you could think about a second vertical, or sorry, not vertical, horizontal axis underneath here, such that this here is our quantity, and that is quantity of tons of greenhouse gas. This is the bad one, right? This is not what we want, but it is a byproduct of our production process. And what we end up seeing is, hey, at this point of production, there is going to similarly be some amount of greenhouse gases being released. And we're making a pretty simple assumption here that, hey, every unit produced, every megawatt hour produced has some amount of constant greenhouse gases being released. That is, it's a linear relationship between the two. Uh, how can we get this value? Well, in order to get this value, what we can look at is, hey, we have total current pollution at 26 tons of greenhouse gas. That is, if we're producing 13 megawatt hours of electricity, we are releasing 26 tons of greenhouse gas. So we have our total pollution at this private optimal as well. One of the things we are going to eventually be interested in is our pollution per unit. That is, hey, how much greenhouse gas is released every time we produce a megawatt hour? And in that case there, that's just greenhouse gas per megawatt hour. So number of greenhouse gases divided by number of megawatt hours, 26 over 13, ah, that'll give us two. So we'll work through that when we need it, but just to kind of set that up for us. Okay, we also have this idea that, hey, we have this cost of production, and right now the firm is not paying for it. They just get to pollute, they just get to have this environmental impact for free. They get to use up the environmental impact with no cost to them. That there, by having no cost to them, that's a social cost. So what we need to realize is that there's going to be this distinction between our marginal private cost and our... I'll draw that guy up there. And our marginal social cost keeping in mind that our marginal social cost that's just going to be the marginal private cost plus our marginal external cost that is the extra cost to society for producing an extra unit so in this case here what we have is this vertical distance vertical distance between the two lines that vertical distance is our marginal external cost. This is constant all the way through, at least our assumption is that it's constant all the way through. That is even right here at the vertical intercept, the difference between 20 and this value is gonna be our marginal external cost. So what we need to do, we need to figure out what is the marginal external cost? What is the extra cost for an extra unit produced? Well, what we do know 
is our total external cost. That is all together what we are paying externally, the cost of society for producing. And that's $130. So, hey, if we have a total external cost of $130 and we are producing 13 units, well then, hey, my cost per unit, my marginal internal cost, the extra cost to produce an extra unit is going to be my total external cost all over my private quantity produced. 130 all over 13, that's going to give us 10. So we're going to get a marginal external cost of $10. That is if this guy here is 20, oh, we see my scale is not perfect, but that's fine. We're just going for the relative side of everything. If this vertical intercept is 20, this vertical intercept is going to be 30. Right again, difference between the two, marginal external cost. Okay, from here, what we then want to figure out is what is my social optimal? That is, from a social perspective, now that we as society have to deal with this pollution cost, uh, we have to deal with that from our viewpoint. What is our optimal as society as to how much electricity should be produced through coal power? And the way we get that is at this intersection between our marginal social cost and our marginal social benefit. Right? Marginal social cost, marginal social benefit gives us our social optimal. So that intersection takes to replace right there. Dragging that down, we'll get our quantity social. So, okay, how do we how do we do that? Well, again, this is going to be setting two curves equal to each other. So those two curves are going to be our marginal social benefit curve. That's just our demand. So we'll go 150 minus 5Q. And that's going to be equal to the marginal social cost curve. Well, the marginal social cost curve, uh, we don't have a formula for that yet. But keep in mind, it was just a parallel shift, so it has the same slope. The only difference is we have a new vertical intercept. That is, the new vertical intercept is $10 more than the existing one, or that new vertical intercept is 30. So that is equals 30 plus 5Q. Okay. Now again, we can consolidate and isolate. So let's go through the same process. We have 150 equals 30 plus 10Q. Bring that 30 over. We have 120 equals 10Q. Finally, divide both sides by 10, and we have 12 equals Q. And that's my private quantity. Sorry, sorry. Social. We're dealing with marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. So that's this guy right here. This is our value of 12. That's a, that's a pretty sloppy two. Let's try that again. There we go. That's a bit better. So we get our value of 12 there. Okay. So now that we have that, next thing we can figure out is, hey, if we had 26 units of pollution, 26 tons of greenhouse gas, we're producing 13 megawatt hours of electricity. Well, how much pollution is going to be attached to 12 megawatt hours? And we can work that out. We can just go, okay, 12, that's going to go down to that guy there. And like I said, in order to figure this out, what we want to do is figure out what is our pollution per megawatt hour. So pollution, tons of greenhouse gas per megawatt hour, 13 megawatt hours. We're going to get two tons of greenhouse gas per megawatt hour. All right, we already went through that implicitly, but just to explicitly write it down. Okay, if every megawatt hour releases two tons of greenhouse gas, well then, when we're producing 12 megawatt hours, so we can go times 12 megawatt hours, right? That's our social optimal. Well, hey, if we're going times 12 megawatt hours, those guys cancel out. And what are we left with? 2 times 12 is 24 tons of greenhouse gas. So 24, uh, let's keep our colors constant. Pollution, we'll use green for pollution. 
So 24, there is my optimal pollution, right? That there is my socially optimal amount of production attached to any amount of production is going to be some amount of pollution. So at this production, optimal, socially optimal production is going to be some socially optimal pollution. The difference, the difference between my private pollution and my socially optimal pollution, that difference right there, let's just uh, make room. I'm just going to delete this bit here. That difference right there, that is 2, right? 26 minus 24. And that there is 2 tons of greenhouse gas. That guy there, that is my optimal abatement. Optimal abatement. That is the optimal amount of pollution that I want to reduce. That is, in order to reach this socially optimal level of pollution, I need to optimally reduce my pollution by two tons of greenhouse, two tons of greenhouse gas in this scenario. So we've seen how we get our optimal pollution. We've seen how we get our optimal abatement. Okay, so we've figured that part out, but uh, how do we actually go about solving this? How do we go about fixing this negative externality? And that is, how do we force society to get to the social optimal. And keep in mind that this will never happen on its own because the economy, the market on its own is a whole bunch of private individuals all acting in their own best interests. So the private individuals will end up at the private optimal. The only way we can end up at the social optimal is through government intervention, forcing us, changing the incentives in order to get us to a socially optimal outcome. So how do we get there? Well, there's two ways that we can do this. The two ways that we can obtain our socially optimal outcome is either through cap and trade or an emissions tax. Okay, what are the differences between the two? Well, underneath a cap and trade model, what we do is we cap the amount of pollution we give every firm processing, every firm operating, we give them a number of pollution permits. Let's say one permit equals one ton of greenhouse gas. So, okay, if one ton of greenhouse gas, that's one permit. Well, how many permits do we want to allow? How many permits are we going to give the firms in this industry? Well, let's keep in mind, optimal pollution was 24 tons of greenhouse gas. So in this case here, we would cap pollution at 24. We would give out 24 pollution permits. We would give these out 24 pollution permits to the industry and we'd say, there you guys go. This is how much you're allowed to pollute. If you don't have a permit, you're not allowed to pollute. From here though, we realize that different firms have different marginal costs. And what we do is we allow these firms to trade their permits amongst themselves. So. Firms that can abate their pollution really easily, well, they're going to sell their permits and they're going to reduce their pollution. Firms that have a really high cost of abating pollution, well, they're going to buy these permits rather than reducing pollution. So by that, we get an efficient mix. And what we end up getting is we end up getting a price of the permit. And we'll work out what that works out to as we carry on. The other side is going to be our emissions tax side. From our emissions tax, well, what we're saying in this case is we're saying, hey, hey, you're producing pollution. We don't want you to pollute. But what we're going to say is go ahead, pollute as much as you want, but we're going to make you actually just pay the social cost of the pollution. And if you can figure out a way to produce without polluting, great, you can continue to put produce and you don't have to pay the tax. This is an optional tax. You only have to pay it if you're going to pollute. And so for the emissions tax, what we want to figure out is some tax per ton of greenhouse gas. Keep in mind this is a little bit different than when we looked at it before. Earlier when we looked at taxes, we were dealing with a tax per unit. That is we were dealing with a tax per on well, this case, megawatt hour. Thing to keep in mind is we don't want to penalize the firms for producing electricity. 
electricity in itself is not a bad. So we don't want to make a negative cost to that. But what we want to do is we want to put a cost on the dollars, or sorry, on the tons of greenhouse gas. And thus, we're going to start charging them some amount of money per ton of greenhouse gas. How do we do this? Well, taking a look at this diagram, right, it looks very much like our traditional tax diagram. We can realize that, hey, in order to get the marginal private cost onto this marginal social cost, well, what we could do is instead of saying, hey, marginal private cost plus this external cost to society, we could go or marginal private cost plus a tax. And if we go marginal private cost plus a tax, well, now we're forcing this cost of pollution to be paid for, not just to be dealt kind of ethereally by everybody in society. It is now explicitly accounted for. And by doing so, what it will do is it causes our marginal private cost curve to kind of fall right on top of our marginal social cost curve because the tax has shifted it. But keep in mind, what's our tax in this scenario? Our tax, uh, it helps if I use the right tool. Our tax in this scenario is $10. One and the same is that marginal external cost. But okay, problem. This tax is $10 per megawatt hour. Problem, we don't want to tax electricity production, right? We want to tax pollution. So in that case there, what we need to figure out is what is the cost per ton of greenhouse gas? Not the cost, not the, right? So, hey, we found this marginal external cost by going total external cost, 130, divided by 13, and hey, 130 divided by 13, that gave us our 10, All right? We did that right here. But hey, that was $10 per megawatt hour. What we wanna figure out is what is the total external cost, and what is that marginal external cost, but not the marginal external cost for an extra megawatt hour produced, but for an extra ton of greenhouse gas. So what we can do is very, very similarly, let's just change colors here. We can go our total external cost divided by our quantity of private pollution, QPP, quantity private pollution. So, hey, in this case here, our total external cost, we had that as 130 all over our quantity of private pollution. That was 26. Okay, if we go through that then, 130 divided by 26. And that gives for us five. Again, that's five dollars per ton of greenhouse gas. So that is from our perspective, what we want to do is we want to put in an optimal tax such that this marginal private cost shifts on top of that marginal social cost curve, but we're taxing the pollution, not the production. So what we want to do is we want to express our tax in terms of a tax per unit polluted, so we would set our optimal emissions tax at $5 a ton. So we have that. Once we set this optimal emissions tax at $5 per ton, what ends up happening? Well, we now have our private cost curve sitting right on top of the social cost curve. We're gonna end up right here. We're gonna end up at 12 units of megawatt hours produced. At 12 megawatt hours produced, we're gonna have 24 tons of greenhouse gas, which is our optimal amount of pollution. That is by putting in this emissions tax, we have also had our optimal amount of abatement being realized. So this should be tons, that looks like an R. T of greenhouse gas, tons of greenhouse gas. So in this sense here, just by setting a tax, we kind of force the hands, we change the incentives of our producers, of our consumers, we reduce our overall quantity supplied to the market, quantity exchanged in the market, and by doing so, we also reduce our pollution. In the short term, this is a win because, hey, less output, less pollution. In the long term, this is also a win because, again, it's an optional tax. You're not paying per megawatt hour. You're paying per ton of greenhouse gas. That is, firms now have an incentive to figure out how to continue to produce megawatt hours without producing greenhouse gases. And so... In this case here, in the long run, in the very long run, 
they will move to either new capital that's more environmentally friendly, or in the very long run, they'll invent new technologies that are similarly more green and allow megawatt hours to be produced with less greenhouse gases to be produced. Okay, so that's our emissions tax side. Let's kind of go back. What about this cap and trade side? Well, underneath the cap and trade side, we said, hey, we're going to cap our pollution, and we capped our pollution at the optimal pollution, so 24. If one ton is one permit, then we were going to give out 24 pollution permits. And again, right, by giving out 24 pollution permits, saying that's all you're allowed to pollute, we are forcing two tons of greenhouse gases to be abated. But we never figured out, hey, what is going to be the price of these permits in the market? Well, in this case, as we force our amount of pollution to be 24, we're forcing our amount of megawatt hours produced to be 12. By forcing this to happen, well, that's going to force us here. And the difference, right, how we get there is because, well, firms have had to pay for the cost of pollution, paying, causing this shift. Hey, the price of this permit is going to work out to be one and the same as what that optimal emissions tax would be. That is, if our cap and trade is set optimally at optimal pollution, price of the permit will end up at the optimal emissions tax. If we set the emissions tax optimally, that is based off this marginal external cost of pollution, then the optimal abatement will end up at the amount of pollution permits issued. That is, these two policies give us the exact same outcomes, they just attack the problem from a different side. Emissions tax, hey, we know that marginal external cost, we'll set that, we'll get optimal abatement, optimal pollution. Cap and trade, we know optimal abatement, we know optimal pollution, we will set that and we will arrive out at an optimal price of pollution. So two different ways to solve the same problem. Okay, last thing I want to do is work through a welfare analysis. That is actually calculate our consumer, producer, social surplus before, that is at the private optimal, and then again after. So we're going to go through that. In order to have some room to go through that, we need to clean up. So I'm going to get rid of all of this extra bit of information on the slide, and we're just going to be left with the graph. So let's go and quickly clean up this mess. Okay, so now that we have everything cleaned up, let's go figure out our let's go figure out our surpluses. So in order to do so, what we need to do is figure out a few more points. That is, we haven't dealt anything with the prices so far. Everything we've had to deal with so far has just been quantities. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to figure out what is the private price. Uh, that's right, price under the tax. Uh, we're going to need to figure out what is the price that producers pay, uh, price that producers receive, rather. And we need to find out what the initial equilibrium price was. So three prices to figure out. Uh, what we're also going to need to figure out is, take this guy all the way up. We need to realize that, hey, at this initial amount produced, 13 megawatt hours, we had our social cost. Right? We had our marginal social cost all the way up there. We don't actually need to calculate that point, but just to keep that in mind that, hey, this line is going to go all the way up because we are going to have some higher marginal social cost than marginal social benefit. That was the nature of our market failure, of course. Okay, so let's start off by calculating these ones. To start off, I'm going to find the initial market price. That is when we were at our private quantity produced of 13. What was the initial price? That is when we saw our market failure. When we weren't accounting for the cost of pollution. Well, just taking a look at this. This is 13 into one of these two curves. What are these two curves? This is my demand, private benefit, social benefit, or this is my supply, my marginal private cost. So that is, I can take 13, put it into either of these two, and I will get my result. So just for ease, I'm going to go and throw it into the supply function. So price is 20 plus 5, 13. Okay, what does that work out? 20 plus 5 times 13, that gives me a price of 85. Great. So we have our price at the initial equilibrium. Let's just uh, make some room. We don't need to keep that uh, sitting around there. 
What about our price tax? That is the price that the consumer is going to end up paying underneath the tax, the emissions tax. We'll just say we're using that, uh, that policy in order to correct this versus the price producer. The price the producer is going to receive underneath this emissions tax. Mind you, this could be cap and trade. It's just going to be the price that the consumer pays after the permit versus the price that the producer receives after they've had to pay for that pollution permit. So same kind of idea, just think about it in terms of permit rather than tax. But to start off, uh, price that the consumer pays. Well, in that case, that's going to be our tax all the way up to these two lines. Uh, what are these two lines? This is our marginal private, marginal social benefit. And this is our marginal social cost. So, hey, we don't have that written down, but keep in mind our marginal social cost, I'll do it in red because it's there in red, is 30 plus 5Q. So what I can do in this scenario is I can throw this 12 either into my demand or into the marginal social cost in red there. Again, I'm just going to throw it into this marginal social cost. So I'm going to have 30 plus 5 times Q, that's 5 times 12, that's going to give me 90. So I'm going to have the price underneath the tax, the price that the consumer pays will be 90. To figure out the price that the producer receives, two ways to do this. Again, we could either take the 12, we could put it into the marginal private cost. Uh, that's really our only option. There's no other intersecting line there. So 12 into marginal private cost. So 12 into this white line there. And we'd get our corresponding price that the producer receives. The other way we could do it though, is we could realize, hey, vertical distance from 90 down. So price that you and I pay as consumers, price that producer receives. Well, hey, this difference is going to be our tax per megawatt hour or that marginal external cost. That is, it's a $10 difference. So 90, that guy, that guy is going to be 80. So now we have all of our points of interest. We have all of our prices. We can now actually go through and start calculating our welfare. So let's start off. Let's start off by doing it at the initial equilibrium. So at initial equilibrium, let's shade it in just so we can see it. I'll use blue for the consumer. Everything below my demand or my willingness to pay all the way up to the price I do pay and the quantity exchange. So this was the initial equilibrium, the private equilibrium. So we have a price of 85 and a quantity exchanged of 13. So all of that shape there, that's going to be the original consumer surplus. Uh, what's that going to be? Let's work it out. Consumer surplus not. Ah, that's just a triangle. One half base times height. So one half base is 13. Height is 150 minus 85. Ah, 150 minus 85, that's 65. So what do I get all together? I get 13 times 65 times one half. I have the consumer surplus of 422 and 50. Great. What about our producer surplus? Well, let's use red for the producer surplus. Everything above my supply, my willingness to accept, that's my marginal private cost curve, all the way up to the quantity exchange of 13, below the price that I actually receive of 85. So we're going to get all of that there as our initial producer surplus. Again, just a triangle. Just a triangle. We can figure that out. Uh, we're going to have our producer surplus initially. Again, one half base times height. That's a base of 13 again. Height, 85 all the way down to 20. So again, that's going to be 65. Like I've tried to make these numbers easy. Uh, producer surplus is going to be. Well, 1 half 13 times 60, oh, that looks pretty much the same. 422.50. Okay. Now, normally we just say, hey, look, that's our social surplus. Consumer, producer, we're all said and done. But keep in mind, we have this external cost. We have this external cost to society that everybody, both consumers and producers, ends up paying. And they end up paying it kind of 
behind the scenes. This is health effects. This is premature death. This is increased uh, COPD. That's asthma and all of those kind of things. All those bad things that we don't really want. The pains on our life due to pollution. Uh, smog, right? That could all be an example of that. Well, let's, uh, let's identify our total external cost in green here. And in this case, keep in mind that we have this marginal external cost, the extra cost to society for every extra megawatt hour produced. And that's this vertical distance. This is then witnessed over 13 units. So what we get is this rectangle. And you're like, that's not a rectangle. It is. It's just kind of fallen over a little bit. It's just a slanted rectangle. We get this rectangle right there as our total external cost. And this is a negative. This enters in negatively into our welfare because we don't like this. So total external cost. This guy here is, well, rectangle base times height. Well, base is 13 times height. Well, the height of that rectangle was our marginal external cost. That is 10. We get our total external cost of 130. Which, hey, if we go back, recall what we were doing before, this is what we started off with, right? We said at the start, total external cost was 130. We're just showing it here on the diagram graphically and uh, geometrically solving for it. Keep in mind, this enters as a negative. So when we're trying to find our social surplus, we're going to go consumer plus producer minus the total external cost, giving us $715 of social surplus. Again, consumer plus producer minus the total external cost. So we have our result there. Okay, let's go and we'll fix this externality. That is, we'll put in an emissions tax or a cap and trade policy. And we'll figure out, hey, underneath this new quantity social and the corresponding price tax price producer receives, we'll figure out what our new updated surplus is. Uh, in order to do so, let's just quickly clean up this diagram. By cleaning up the diagram, we can just kind of start over. And I'm not going to erase the whole diagram. I'm just going to get rid of all the shading. So let's go take a look at that. Okay, restarting, we want to figure out, hey, underneath this emissions tax, let's say, what is our new social surplus? So again, we want to go through this as what is the consumer producer? And in this case, our external cost will actually be internalized. We'll actually have to have paid it. So it's no longer an external cap um, cost, it's, but it's still going to show up as tax revenue, right? So it's still going to show up in that way there. So starting off, well, let's take a look at our uh consumer surplus again yeah we'll start off with our consumer we did consumer in blue so below my willingness to pay up until the quantity exchange which is now 12 above the price i do pay which is now that price tax that's 90. okay so we have our consumer surplus uh, again that's just just a triangle we can do that consumer surplus is one half Base is now 12. Height is 150 minus 90. Well, 150 minus 90, that's 60. So I get my, oh, that helps if I can write. I get my consumer surplus after to be 1 half times 12 times 60. I'm now getting $360 worth of consumer surplus. We see we've kind of uh, consolidated the initial case a little bit here, uh, but we can see quite clearly consumers, they're going to be sad. They've, they've lost. They've lost underneath this scenario. Uh, what about producers? What does happen for the producer scenario? Well, again, this is above my willingness to accept my supply, my marginal private cost, up until the quantity exchange below the price I receive of 80 Ah, uh, where we go? This red triangle becomes my producer surplus. Okay, working that out. It's just a triangle again. Producer surplus. This is one half. Again, I'm going to have a base of 12. Height of 80 minus 20. That's again 60. Sorry, this guy here. Kind of tough to see. That's a 12. Okay, what do we get then? Producer surplus one is, see, that's the same as that one again, 360. So, ooh, again, producers have lost. 
So we have consumers lo losing. We have producers losing. That's not good. Uh, we're not quite at the point of getting social surplus. We still have our tax revenue to figure out. Uh, so in this case here, the tax revenue, we're collecting an emissions tax equal to this distance, right? $10 per megawatt hour is what that's working out to right now. And that's over 12 units being produced all together. Okay. So there we go. We get our tax revenue. That tax revenue, that's just a box. Um, oh, I don't have a brown for this one. Uh, we'll use yellow. Uh, yellow's for that one. Um, we'll use red, I guess. Oh, I'm already using red. We'll use white. There we go. Okay. So tax revenue in white. There we go. This is a positive because this tax revenue can now be collected by the government and redistributed back to the people. So it does work out to be a positive. And in this case here, it's just a rectangle. So base times height, that's 12 times a height of 10. That's going to be 120. So $120 worth of tax revenue. Altogether, then, we get our social surplus, which is 360 plus 360, right? So, hey, that's just consumer plus producer plus our tax revenue of 120. And we get our social surplus of $840. So, hey, look at that. Initially, we had a social surplus of 715. After we have a social surplus of 840, we're actually better off with this tax in place. Society wins. We have intervened in a market and we have increased social surplus. We have increased efficiency. We have made this market better. Yay. But okay, if this is the case, how come our carbon tax, how come this whole emissions... Uh, Policy is so hotly debated. How come it's so vehemently opposed by, it seems, everybody? Well, again, if we just take a look at things, consumers, they are worse off. Producers, they are worse off. So together, they're both upset about this. Government, well, government wins. Government's making tax revenue, so they're, they're happy about it. And society wins, but from my perspective, what society? Who cares about society if my life is harder? So what we see is that this policy, it does increase altogether social welfare. It does make everybody together better off. This tax money does come back to both producers and consumers in a way that does make them better off. But because we don't directly see it at the time, we're hurt, we're upset, and so... Typically, we end up being opposed to such policies. Even though society on whole is much better off, we're living longer, we have cleaner environment, we're no longer having smog days, uh, we're no longer having excessive heat warnings or any of the other things that go along with our negatives of climate change. So, but again, that's kind of this ethereal impact. It doesn't impact me directly today. Today, I'm paying more for electricity, and that's making me worse off. Okay, so that's our overview. What we've taken a look at in this video is to go kind of from the end back to the start. We've taken a look at our welfare analysis. We've seen that underneath an emissions tax or cap and trade that we are as a society better off by correcting this negative externality. We've seen that welfare after, welfare before. What we did before that is we took a look at actually calculating our private optimal, our social optimal. We then worked out the amount of pollution attached to each one. From that amount of pollution, we worked out our optimal abatement, our optimal pollution. We worked out the emissions tax, not in terms of dollars per unit produced, but in terms of dollars per unit polluted. And we worked out what our capped amount of pollution should be for a cap and trade system. If you have any questions on this video, please feel free to let me know. Uh, you can comment below, you can post on D2L, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.